Okay, so it's a little bit after 11 now. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, and thanks for joining in. I know it's kind of a long day of Zoom meetings, um, but we'll get started. Today I'm gonna to be talking about some COVID related toxicology cases. I know we're probably all sick of hearing about COVID by now, um, but there's been some interesting tox cases that have been highlighted by this pandemic, probably spurred on by people's fear and uh, misinformation in the media going on. I wanna say a big thank you to uh, Dr. Jake Case for being my supervisor for these rounds and kind of helping get everything together with me. And uh, Morgan Reagan was also a big help in putting this uh, together. Once we kind of realized we were gonna do a talks related grand rounds, uh, she was the first person that I emailed. Uh, so yeah, so objectives here today, we're gonna to be talking about some pathophysiology, clinical presentation of uh, some related toxicology. The past couple of months, uh, sorry, somebody's not muted. Oh, there we go. These last couple of months have kind of been a uh, case study in what uh, in what happens when kind of an uneducated orange man can give out uh, medical advice on an international scale. And I just happen to have an example of this here. I apologize if the video uh, lags a little bit, but we have to kind of change some of the settings. Thank you very much. So I have Bill. A question that probably some of you are thinking of if you're totally into that world, which I find to be very interesting. So supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light, and I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. We'll the right, folks who could. right, and then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside, or or almost a cleaning? Because you see, it gets on the lungs, and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds it sounds interesting to me. So we'll see about the concept of the light, the way it kills it in one minute. What? It's, uh, that's pretty powerful. have done a really terrific. Yeah, so you kind of get the get the point of that. With all this talk about COVID uh, and the use of disinfectants and cleaners, um, the exposures to both disinfectants and household cleaners have gone up significantly. Um, household cleaners were already ranked uh, kind of in the top three for calls to the Ontario Poison Control Center and uh, number two for calls regarding children under five years old. And this is some data that you can see here presented by the CDC um, with regards to uh, American Poison Control Centers uh, compared to kind of the previous two years. You can see the uh, massive uptake in calls regarding these exposures um, kind of with the temporal relationship uh, with the start of this pandemic. And so that brings us to our first case. Uh, this is a case of a 47-year-old male who was out shopping, but he was not wearing a face mask. Um, so he decided that when he got home, he should wash his mouth out with some Clorox bleach uh, to try to disinfect it. Um, but he accidentally swallowed a mouthful, kind of panicked and called 911, um, presented with your, to your emergency department with the vitals that you can see there. Um, I can't really see who's online. Uh, Adam Foley, you're the only resident I can actually see in my list. I hate to uh, uh, pick on you, but just quickly tell me what uh, what you think uh, you'd be concerned about in this patient and anything you'd be looking for on physical exam real quick. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, yeah, I think obviously the biggest issue here is uh, this is obviously number one toxic and number two can burn all the way down as airway and esophagus. So the things that would uh, make me concerned is anywhere from kind of a lip burn all the way down to uh, burn down his airway, burn down his esophagus, uh, if they're actually even able to protect their airway as well. And um, if, uh, you know, they're, they're even kind of alert, I, I don't know what else they took with it as well. If, oh, you assume they probably just took Clorox, but uh, I think we worry about potential other causes as well. But I think really the burn is the biggest thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so that's uh, that's kind of what I was getting at here. And for this first case, we'll kind of use this case as a, a stepping stone to talk about the pathophysiology and management of um, some kind of household cleaner ingestions, focusing on bleach because it's one of the more common ones, uh, but also give kind of a, a broad overview of caustic ingestions, kind of as uh, Adam was referring to, this would be a, a caustic injury with uh, risk of injury to the esophagus. 
Now, I promise that this is kind of the only Rosen style list in my grand round, but uh, these are helpful things to keep in mind anytime you're trying to risk stratify somebody uh, in your mind that is presented to your emergency department with a history of uh, caustic ingestion. The most important determinant of injury from a caustic ingestion is the pH of the substance uh, ingested, either highly acidic or highly alkaline, if they fall on kind of either end of that spectrum. Now, alkalized substances are thought to be a little bit more harmful as they uh, produce kind of this liquefactive necrosis compared to acids that cause a coagulative necrosis and can kind of uh, wall off uh, um, the deeper tissues from the, from the acid. Acids also produce this uh, kind of burning sensation anytime you ingest them, and it makes it harder for larger volumes to be ingested or kind of a large volume accidental ingestion. Other things that other characteristics that increase the risk of uh, uh, injury from caustic ingestions include um, high viscosity. So think about kind of your gels. Um, these increase the contact time with the mucosal surfaces. And then solids and crystals tend to be very pure or crystallized acid or base and ingestion of them results in kind of a very highly concentrated solution when mixed with either saliva or gastric contents. Um, and then like Adam, uh, Adam said, if this is an intentional ingestion, if there's a, a multiple ingestion or it's a high volume ingestion, these are other things you need to be concerned about. We'll see that uh, mixing household cleaners can be very problematic later in the rounds and mixing them inside your stomach is also a very bad idea. Lower risk ingestions tend to be things like low viscosity or dilute solutions, things with a neutral pH or if it's an unintentional uh, or accidental ingestion. So this slide shows kind of a selection of household products and where they fall on that uh, all important pH scale. On that far left, you can see uh, uh, the acidic materials, which are classically your toilet bowl uh, cleaners. Uh, these tend to be kind of either uh, hydrochloric or sulfuric acid and uh, very uh, high risk or caustic injury. In the middle there, kind of more dilute, um, are your all-purpose kind of multi-surface cleaners uh, that you would use on like a tabletop or a counter. They tend to be quite dilute and have a more neutral pH. Getting to the right side, household bleach, you can see there kind of falls in the pH of around 11 to 12 range and is a uh, fairly strong alkali. And then on the very far right, your oven cleaners, and also not shown here are your uh, drain cleaners, uh, have, are very caustic and have a pH of around 14, kind of as alkali as you can get. This is a quick overview of what household bleach is. Um, the active ingredient in bleach is something called sodium hypochlorite. Um, in general, the concentration of sodium hypochlorite in uh, household bleaches ranges from kind of 1% to 8%. And uh, your kind of prototypical Clorox bleach is around 5 5.5%. Uh, sodium hypochlorite has antibacterial properties of concentrations as low as 0.5 or 1%. And so it's sometimes kind of added to household cleaners so that can be marketed as antibacterial, as you'd see kind of in a Lysol uh, spray. Now bleach is a uh, strong oxidizer. That's how it works both as a uh, bleaching agent, but also as an antibacterial. The toxicity ranges from just kind of mild irritation to full on mucosal necrosis, kind of depending on the concentration and volumes that were uh, involved. And the chemistry behind it, you have to, uh, you have to forgive me for this chemistry, but um, sodium hypochlorite will readily dissociate into oxygen and salt. And the hypochlorite ion, which is also kind of always present in a bleach solution, um, also kind of dissociates into chloride and oxygen uh, uh, radical, or sorry, chlorine and oxygen radicals. So following ingestion of uh, sodium hypochlorite or bleach, um, a lot of people actually just be asymptomatic from this, especially if there's a low volume unintentional ingestion. Uh, those with symptoms, the predominant symptom will be uh, nausea, vomiting, maybe some mild abdominal pain. And then, like Adam mentioned, things like mouth burning or hematemesis are a lot more concerning features. And then anytime you have airway or uh, respiratory symptoms or things you should be very concerned about, this could be potentially be kind of upper airway edema or developing uh, airway obstruction. This is a table taken from a 2001 study that looked retrospectively at 85 children following caustic ingestion. Uh, this table lists symptoms and exposures that were more pre most predictive of severe lesions um, on upper endoscopy. Highlighted in red there are the uh, most concerning features. So respiratory distress, hematemesis, 
or patients with three or more of these symptoms um, all had a positive predictive value of one for having severe endoscopic lesions. Interestingly, patients with no symptoms uh, never had any severe endoscopic lesions. And oropharyngeal lesions, uh, Adam was kind of mentioning, are their mouth burns. Um, this is something that surprised me. The presence of oropharyngeal lesions does not actually suggest the presence of esophageal lesions, and their absence does also not rule out the presence of esophageal lesions. This is an uh, older study um, done in children that ingested specifically uh, Clorox uh, ingestion. They looked at 129 cases over eight years. Of these 129 cases of Clorox ingestion, um, there were no long-term complications encountered, such as stricture in these children. Now, 65 patients underwent endoscopy, and uh, two of those 65 patients did have kind of some mild erythema, kind of a grade one uh, injury, but not capable of producing any long-term uh, injury or uh, stricture. A much more recent 2017 study uh, retrospectively compared 137 patients uh, ages 12 and up with caustic ingestion. This is a more kind of emerge relevant uh, population. Uh, most of these uh, ingestions were uh, suicide attempts. And you can see there that um, the authors compared bleach ingestion to a control group. The control group consisting of basically uh, all other patients with uh, caustic ingestion. The bleach group uh, did comparatively a lot better. 95% of patients had no signs of any esophageal injury on uh, endoscopy and none of them had any high-grade injury. Compared to control group made of uh, patients had ingested any other type of caustic uh, material, 7% of those patients developed high-grade esophageal injury and six patients actually, uh, actually died in the control group. Now, caustic injury is not the only concern with bleach ingestion. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is basically a sodium, oxygen, and chlorine atom combined. And this sodium and chloride will eventually be systemically taken up. This is a case of a 66-year-old female who ingested two cups of 10% bleach. And on admission, her so serum sodium was initially 150 and rose to 169 eight hours later. And she also had a hyperchloremic acidosis with a chloride of 130. Um, I also saw a case report of a post-mortem uh, analysis of a patient uh, following bleach ingestion, and their vitreous fluid had a sodium level of 187. So something to keep in mind that uh, two cups of 10% bleach will contain around 700 millimoles of, uh, of sodium. This is quite a dramatic uh, kind of end of the spectrum uh, uh, case on the other side. This is a case of a 16-year-old female who only ingested 100 mils of bleach. Uh, but she required intubation and underwent endoscopy 10 days after ingestion with severe stenosis. 16 days following her ingestion, she developed uh, uh, some episodes of vomiting, after which she had chest pain and fever. And you can see kind of why here. Um, she has abnormal soft tissue and air um, just adjacent to her uh, esophagus with an associated right-sided pneumothorax. And she has barium extravasation outside of her uh, esophagus on her barium study. Um, for those of us that aren't gastroenterologists, kind of as a general rule of thumb, the barium stays inside the esophagus. Um, but this really highlights the caustic potential uh, for delayed sequelae of bleach ingestion. Now, bleach is not the only thing that you can find to drink kind of in your uh, kitchen uh, cupboards. And these other substances, kind of these multi-surface or all-purpose cleaners, are also fairly common ingestions. Now there's hundreds of different uh, brands and each brand has uh, tons of different SKUs on them. So it's very difficult to predict uh, what toxicity can result from them and what their ingredients are. Uh, kind of down here, you can see you have uh, uh, Windex, uh, but you can have Windex multi-surface, you can have Windex with vinegar, um, you can have Windex uh, antibacterial sprays. So it's very difficult to predict as, uh, exactly what is in these cleaners. As a general rule, your Windex and your Lysols are ammonium-containing compounds with a pH kind of around 10 and do have a risk of caustic injury associated with them. Other cleaners are based off of uh, weak acids, either lactic or acetic acid, and uh, can cause metabolic derangements as well as uh, caustic injury following ingestion. And then, not as common, but some cleaners are based off of alcohol. Um, 
certainly you have to be worried about the presence of toxic alcohols in these cleaners, but it is a lot, uh, a lot more rare these days. Um, most of them are based also off of isopropyl alcohol. Um, but you do have to be worried about uh, CNS depression and kind of inebriation. What I want you to take away from this is that uh, really calling poison control for any patient with a substantial ingestion of a multi-surface cleaner will be critical. They'll be able to uh, kind of help look up the MSDS or the active ingredients and uh, give you some uh, recommendations for these because there's uh, such a huge variety of these types of cleaners. And then probably what should make you the most worried if a patient presents with ingestion of either, either an oven or a drain cleaner. Um, oven and drain cleaners tend to be uh, very alkaline. Going back to that pH scale, we have a pH usually of 14, um, made up generally of sodium hydroxide, also known as lye or caustic soda. Um, and thinking about it intuitively, the oven cleaners are designed to take kind of baked on greases and charcoals um, and they essentially saponify them so that they can be easily wiped off. Um, so you can imagine what it would do to healthy tissue. Uh, these kind of Drano crystals are uh, just uh, pure sodium hydroxide in crystallized form. Anytime you see a, a profound uh, kind of picture in a textbook relating to caustic injury, um, you can check the caption and it usually is related to sodium hydroxide. Um, there's a couple of profound ones in rows and uh, kind of a hemorrhagic esophagus and stomach. So in terms of managing these patients, uh, certainly signs of airway injury should uh, make you quite concerned. Things like strider um, and dyspnea. Um, you have to think about endotracheal intubation in these patients, although it is very rare from uh, a household cleaner. Um, and this probably isn't a straightforward RSI, but rather kind of an awake intubation uh, um, with a double setup if you're worried about an upper airway obstruction. As a rule, patients with intentional large volume or uh, symptomatic uh, following caustic ingestion need to be admitted only for um, metabolic uh, kind of monitoring, but also for endoscopy. And as a guideline, pediatric patients following alkali ingestions with uh, the symptoms of vomiting and drooling or strider alone, or if they have drooling, um, or vomiting and not taking PO intake need to be admitted for uh, monitoring and endoscopy. Certainly you wanna contact your poison control center and reasonable initial investigations would be kind of our standard tox labs, making sure we get a blood gas as well as an osmolality. Um, you wanna get an ECG on these patients and a chest X-ray if uh, indicated will kind of be a appropriate initial management for us. Things that aren't recommended, uh, probably just as importantly, so we're not doing harm to our patients. It probably goes without saying, but you do not want to induce emesis, kind of have that caustic, uh, take a second pass of the esophagus after they uh, uh, throw it back up. You do not want to attempt to neutralize an acid with a base or vice versa. Um, the caustic injury has already happened once they swallowed it. So you're just uh, exposing a patient to further, uh, further caustic uh, injury, as well as a thermal reaction that can occur. Gentle sips of water are probably appropriate following uh, uh, ingestion of a caustic substance, kind of 30 minutes post ingestion, but other than that, patients should be NPO. Uh, charcoal is not effective. Uh, the caustic injury has already happened um, and it's gonna have little effect, kind of any metabolic things that happen. Um, and probably most importantly, it's just going to obscure whatever the endoscopist is uh, gonna try to find when they uh, put the camera down. Gastric lavage also generally contraindicated uh, in patients with uh, caustic ingestion. Uh, you don't want to be putting a garden, you know, the garden hose in these people's faces when you're worried about uh, damage to the esophagus because they could certainly perforate it at that point. There's no role for prophylactic antibiotics unless people have uh, signs of mediastinitis, fever, all that kind of stuff. Um, steroids are a bit of a contentious topic, uh, certainly outside of the realm of. Uh, starting in the emergency department. There are some cases of patients with kind of true B esophageal injury where uh, they can be started on a short course of methylprene, but again, that will be left to the admitting team or the uh, discretion of uh, GI. Now, this is a flowchart from uh, the man himself, Dr. Bob Hoffman, in a paper uh, he co-authored, uh, published earlier this year in the New England Journal. And it's a great uh, flowchart for overview of caustic ingestion. Uh, most of our kind of bleach patients that accidentally ingested bleach will fall along this kind of far left arm. 
where they can be observed as long as they remain asymptomatic in the emergency department and tolerating PO fluid, and then safely discharged home because of the low risk for any uh, uh, long-term sequelae. Um, patients with mild symptoms, so maybe a patient that has some vomiting or drooling or aren't able to take PO intake, um, can be made trial of NPO overnight for the trial of fluids uh, the next day. But pretty much every other patient you're going to want to admit um, and have them undergo endoscopy um, and be made NPO. The rest of the management is kind of outside the realm of, uh, of the emergency department. The local practice at LHSC, um, both from GI and uh, thoracics, um, it tends to be endoscopy within 24 hours. Uh, I emailed Dr. Janie Greger and uh, Dr. Maltainer, who both agreed that they want to try to uh, um, scope these patients within 24 hours to risk stratify them and kind of know what they're dealing with uh, and make decisions uh, based on that, whether or not these patients need to be NPO for a long time, have a feeding tube inserted, all that kind of stuff. And this, uh, this classification is fairly universal um, in looking at endoscopy findings in patients with uh, uh, caustic ingestion. The further down you go or the higher grade you are, uh, your risk of esophageal stricture and the significant morbidity and mortality associated with that um, goes up uh, significantly. So this brings us to our second case. Um, this is a uh, based off of a real case that was presented by the CDC uh, regarding COVID and the use of household cleaners. It's a case of a 40-year-old female who presents with uh, shortness of breath, coughing, and wheezing. She's able to tell you that she heard she should be washing her groceries after purchasing them. Um, so when she got home, she filled her sink with uh, some bleach, um, vinegar, and uh, some hot water. Now, washing, while she was washing her other groceries, she noticed kind of this noxious smell and uh, developed uh, coughing and wheezing. Um, and presents kind of with the, with the aforementioned symptoms. Now, do any of the uh, PGY, uh, any of the residents uh, want to take a stab at what they think is causing this uh, patient's symptom? Thank you. I saw Patrice just enter the waiting room. She's a chemistry major. Um, Patrice, any idea what would, uh, what would be causing this patient's symptom? Okay, well, uh, so for the, for the case, we'll, we'll discuss kind of the pathophysiology and management of patients with inhalational injury from household cleaners. This is actually a case of uh, chlorine gas exposure. Um, most of us know chlorine gas as a uh, kind of chemical warfare agent that was first used in World War I. Um, it's actually first used uh, by Axis forces against Canadian troops. Um, and is still unfortunately in use, uh, kind of in conflicts around the world today, even though it's uh, uh, outlawed by the Geneva codes. Um, it's made in your kitchen sink very easily. You combine bleach with any acid. Uh, vinegar and uh, toilet bowl cleaners are the most common ones. It produces a kind of noxious uh, chlorine smell and is classified as a pulmonary irritant. Um, and in 2016, I couldn't find any more recent data, but 2016, uh, American Poison Control Centers had over 6,300 cases of chlorine gas exposure. Um, and a third of them were actually from just mixing household, uh, household cleaners. It kind of has this yellowy, uh, yellowy tinge to it, and it is heavier than air. Um, and you can see the concentrations, eye and respiratory symptoms start at the fairly low concentrations, kind of uh, respiratory symptoms as low as 10 parts per million. Now, industrial gases uh, and liquids have this IDLH level associated with them, uh, immediately dangerous to life and health. And chlorine gas uh, has an IDLH level of 10 parts per million, which doesn't really mean a lot. But when we compare it to other kind of dangerous gases that we think about, hydrogen cyanide with an IDLH level of uh, 50, and phosgene, which is a, a very lethal chemical warfare agent, an IDLH level of 2. I think it's uh, pretty interesting you can you know, make something that sits between cyanide and phosgene on a danger scale um, in your kitchen sink. Uh, this is the last chemistry equation in my grand rounds, um, but helps us kind of understand the pathophysiology. Uh, sodium hypochlorite in solution always kind of reaches this equilibrium between sodium hypochlorite and uh, uh, hypochlorous acid. 
when any acid is added to uh, uh, hydrochloric acid, uh, in this case, hydrochloric acid, it forms water and chlorine gas that can travel uh, to the lungs. Now in the lungs, uh, it essentially undergoes that reaction in reverse. So it's not the chlorine gas specifically that causes damage to the airways or causes the pulmonary irritation, um, but the fact that chlorine combines with water kind of in the uh, surface of the uh, airways and your mucosal surfaces and in your eyes and reforms hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid. And these uh, kind of are responsible for the clinical effects. The first of which is airway smooth, uh, smooth muscle constriction, responsible for the coughing and the wheezing and the chest tightness that patients would present with. And then down the road and at high enough concentrations, you can get uh, kind of epithelial and mitochondrial injury um, that can produce the chemical pneumonitis, uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and progression to ARGS. Like I said, the clinical features tend to be that of uh, kind of a reactive airway, something called RADS or uh, reactive airway dysfunction syndrome. Um, patients have a decrease in their FEV1, their peak expiratory flows and all that. Um, this graph on the right is from a 2006 uh, RCT that compared nebulized sodium bicarb to nebulized placebo. Um, it shows that patients exposed to chlorine gas do have a decrease in their FEV1 initially but this will improve over time. There was a small uh, statistically significant benefit with the use of nebulized sodium bicarb and FEV1 at two and four hours. But really what this, uh, I hope this graph shows is that uh, FEV1 is decreased and will, uh, um, but is a reversible uh, uh, decrease initially. Uh, management, there's no, uh, there's no kind of silver bullet here. Management is aggressive supportive care. Uh, you wanna use uh, supplemental oxygen, uh, bronchodilators are helpful to reverse that uh, uh, reactive airways. Um, either systemic or inhaled steroids, such as budesonide, have been described in the literature. Uh, nebulized sodium bicarb can, uh, can also be administered, probably in the uh, consultation with a poison control center. Um, and if these patients progress to respiratory failure, they may need positive pressure ventilation or endotracheal, ent uh, endotracheal intubation for uh, you know, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or ARDS. Now we won't get into too many details here, uh, but these are kind of some other things that you can make just in your kitchen sink. If you combine uh, bleach and ammonia, you can have the production of what are called chloramine gases, which are also classified as a pulmonary irritant and uh, responsible for that chest x-ray that you see on the right. Well, this patient has a severe chemical pneumonitis requiring intubation. Um, from mixing of household uh, bleach and ammonia. Uh, the mixture of bleach and acetone or mixing bleach and isopropyl alcohol can also uh, generate chloroform. And so finally, for my last case, uh, this is also based off of a real case that I think a lot of us probably heard about in the news. It kind of made international headlines when it happened. This is a case of a 65-year-old man that uh, presents to the emergency department. He's uh, He's vomiting, he's drowsy and confused. He's also found to be hypotensive and has the vital signs shown there. Um, kind of in the interest of time, we won't go through the broad differential. Um, and it just so happens that the patient's wife is in the emergency department and is able to tell you that uh, they drank aquarium cleaner containing chloroquine um, to help prevent them catching COVID. So for the remainder of my talk, we'll go over um, kind of the pathophysiology, the clinical presentation and management of patients with uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, poisoning. These are kind of two medications that we don't uh, often think about and aren't very common on patients' medication unless in the emergency department um, and probably two medications we don't know a whole lot about, but I found somebody who's um, able to explain it very well. drug called chloroquine and some people would add to it hydroxy hydroxychloroquine so chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine now this is a common malaria drug it's also a drug used for 
strong arthritis. Uh, somebody has pretty serious arthritis. Uh, also uses this in a somewhat different form. But it is known as a malaria drug, and it's been around for a long time, and it's very powerful. But the nice part is it's been around for a long time. So we know that if it if if things don't go as uh, planned, it's not going to kill anybody. Um, and so this is kind of one of the many headlines that uh, picked up on this unfortunate uh, case. Um, this was a husband and wife uh, that both ingested this uh, chloroquine uh, containing aquarium cleaner. The husband unfortunately died, but the wife uh, did survive. Um, and her account of uh, kind of how everything happened is pretty shocking, but it gives us a good sense of kind of the clinical uh, manifestations and how rapid um, these medications can be uh, uh, toxic and lethal. In her interview, she said that uh, within 20 minutes of drinking this, uh, they both became extremely ill, uh, first kind of feeling dizzy and hot. Um, and she says that uh, she started vomiting, her husband developed respiratory symptoms and wanted to hold her hand. Um, she called 911, remembers them asking a lot of questions, and she was having a hard time talking and remembers falling down a lot. Um, and then shortly after arriving to hospital, um, her husband died. In the midst of this COVID pandemic, uh, um, people are trying to buy hydroxychloroquine, spurred on kind of a media touting it as a legitimate treatment, um, and also with you know fear of uh, COVID itself. And uh, the amount of people trying to purchase this online has surged, as this, uh, this study in JAMA, published in April of this year, shows. Now, these are not just people Googling hydroxychloroquine. These are search terms specifically related to trying to purchase hydroxychloroquine online. Um, so Google, Amazon, or Walmart. Um, and the association with some media um, kind of releases, uh, Musk and Trump endorsing uh, hydroxychloroquine as a COVID treatment. I know what you guys are thinking that this is probably fake news. Um, so I did a little digging myself. Um, last week, James was trying to buy anabolic steroids off of uh, Amazon for his grand rounds. And so I thought I'd see if I can get my hands on some chloroquine. Um, unfortunately, you can't get chloroquine on uh, Amazon, but you can get this book about chloroquine, uh, chloroquine and body tissues. Uh, it's the paperback edition for $77. It talks about the effects of chloroquine on the body, um, kind of histologically and stereologically. Um, it sounds really good. Uh, not available on Prime, unfortunately, so why bother? Um, but it was the reviews that kind of caught my attention. Uh, this first review published in March uh, 23rd um, says the one star review. It's just a book. I bought this thinking it was medicine and uh, also posted a picture of the book in the box, which I think is incredible. Um, the second person here obviously didn't read uh, this person's review, um, posted on May 3rd saying it's a book and not medicine. Um, and this is my, this is my, this one's my favorite. Uh, this person says, I thought I was buying pills or meds. Um, I don't like to read much. I wouldn't pay $80 for a book. It's not my thing to read. Thank you. Uh, with a solid two-star review. Um, so this just kind of goes that shows that what people are doing with the fear and kind of media misinformation uh, with this COVID pandemic. So like the President very uh, clearly explained that uh, both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are used as malaria medications, both for treatment and uh, prophylaxis. Um, hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil is probably what we see more commonly in the emergency department. Uh, it is less toxic and uh, more common used for things like lupus, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or some people would call it strong arthritis. Um, it's dose kind of 200 to 400 milligrams a day in 200 milligram tabs, while chloroquine comes in these 250 or 500 milligram tablets. Both of these medications, the concerning side effect is prolongation of the QTC. Now chloroquine, which is the more toxic of the two, um, ingestion of five grams or more is kind of considered severe, um, where two to four grams or as little as four pills um, is classified as moderately severe in a lot of, uh, a lot of the literature. Hydroxychloroquine is quoted to be kind of uh, three to five times less toxic, so requiring three to five times a higher dose. A 
quick note about the pharmacokinetics of these medications because it helps us understand both the uh, uh, kind of clinical picture and also the treatment. Uh, it's rapidly bioavailable, uh, kind of 80% or more, and the serum concentrations peak very quickly following ingestion, um, with peaking within two to five hours. About 50% protein bound, and it is highly lipophilic um, and has a very wide volume of distribution uh, uh, thereafter. So essentially, serum levels are going to spike quite quickly, um, and then the, the medication will uh, widely distribute. Probably explains why, in the case we saw, the, the uh, two patients became very sick very rapidly. The clinical effects of this uh, uh, toxicity can be broken down into CNS, RESP, and CVS, or uh, cardiovascular uh, symptoms. In terms of CNS, uh, the common things would be uh, drowsiness and confusion and some visual disturbances, but like any good poison uh, kind of ends in that seizure coma death uh, uh, pathway. It can cause a, a low respirate or a sudden apnea, uh, neither of which are very good, uh, but it's the cardiac and uh, uh, cardiac effects that uh, ultimately cause the mortality. It's able to block both uh, sodium and potassium channels, uh, which causes uh, a kind of characteristic QRS uh, widening and prolongation of the QTC not too dissimilar from what we would see in uh, tricyclic antidepressants, although um, uh, tachycardia is uh, not usually a feature of, uh, of this poisoning. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine also cause a hypotension, both through uh, alpha blockade, but also a significant uh, negative inotropic effect. And severely poisoned patients will have EFs kind of down in the 20%. This is an ECG showing evidence of uh, sodium channel blockade. Um, without the tachycardia, we'd be used to seeing from things like tricyclic antidepressants. This is a 23-year-old uh, female who ingested 10 grams of chloroquine and survived. And I think uh, kind of without fully interpreting the ECG, if we had a poison patient with this ECG, we would certainly be concerned. Um, this is another ECG of a patient that ingested 20 grams of hydroxychloroquine. Um, you can see evidence of sodium channel blockade and a prolonged QRS, um, but there's also short runs of uh, ventricular tachycardia. And later in the rhythm strip, you see uh, multiple PVCs and ventricular ectopy. Um, this patient also had a potassium 2.3. And that brings me to what I would I kind of call the potassium paradox of uh, chloroquine poisoning. This is one of the unique features of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, in that hypokalemia is uh, almost always present in uh, uh, poison patients. And it's usually a very severe and uh, uh, rapid hypokalemia and is prognostic of a bad outcome. The hypokalemia will occur within the first couple hours as those serum levels are spiking and occur so rapidly that it's probably secondary to an intracellular shift mechanism rather than uh, um, kind of whole body depletion or excretion of potassium. Now, the use of sodium bicarb for a wide QRS uh, can also worsen this hyper, hypokalemia through kind of alkalinization and increased renal excretion. Um, you can certainly aggressively replace patients' potassium during their resuscitation, um, but as the toxicity resolves and the serum levels go down and the medication distributes widely, the intracellular shift reverses, and as patients improve from kind of their shock states, uh, they can have fatal hyperkalemia. It kind of creates a damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, kind of scenario. And another unique feature of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is the use of uh, diazepam as this kind of quote unquote antidote. Observational data from kind of the 60s, 70s and 80s showed that patients that uh, attempted suicide with chloroquine who also co-ingested diazepam actually did quite well and escape the cardiac effects of chloroquine. Uh, this team, Ryu et al. Um, in 1988, showed this experimentally in pigs um, who they administered chloroquine boluses to. And then the experimental group received a very high dose diazepam uh, regimen shown on the left there um, and did a lot better both in terms of uh, systolic blood pressure, math, uh, urine output, um, and heart rate. The same team eventually adopted this high dose diazepam in combination with uh, another kind of standardized treatment of early intubation, epinephrine as a vasopressor and the use of uh, sodium bicarbonate. And they found that when 
all of these were combined for the treatment of uh, chloroquine poisoning, survival went from 9%, 9% in retrospective controls to about 90% in their experimental groups. Um, it's obviously not the most robust uh, methodology by any means, but uh, certainly did pave the way for uh, um, the current treatment for uh, this poisoning. There's a few mechanisms by which people postulate diazepam works in this scenario. Um, some thinks it works in a kind of a central antagonistic way to chloroquine. Um, there's an anticonvulsant effect from diazepam, and other people postulate it's a kind of an electrophysiologic mechanism where it's inverse to the chloroquine uh, action on the myocardium. So with all that in mind, uh, the management for patients poisoned with uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, early intubation is uh, one of the mainstays. These patients are prone to apnea, seizures, and cardiac arrests or arrhythmias, so you don't have an endotracheal tube in um, before all that happens. But probably just as importantly is the fact that uh, endotracheal tube will expedite the use of uh, gastric lavage, lavage and charcoal, um, which is uh, generally very effective in chloroquine poisoning. Uh, epinephrine is the presser of choice and helps reverse kind of the uh, alpha mediated hypotension as well as uh, uh, reverse the negative ionotropic effects of chloroquine. High dose diazepam, like two milligrams per kilogram, um, bolus dose followed by an infusion. Um, can be used for patients in refractory shock. Uh, you want to be very closely monitoring their potassium uh, with cautious replacement, get them out of kind of the dangerous uh, hypokalemia levels, um, which could contribute to cardiac arrhythmia, but keeping a close eye on things even after their uh, shock state resolves. And then certainly sodium bicarbonate for a wide QRS or cardiac arrhythmias is very reasonable. Uh, like I mentioned, serum levels tend to be very high acutely, um, peaking kind of in two to four hours, 50% uh, protein bound and is very lipophilic. So it makes it a good, uh, potentially a good target for intralipid therapy. This case out of the Netherlands is a 27 year old female who um, in kind of hindsight had ordered chloroquine online uh, for suicide, uh, to commit suicide. And it obviously worked very well, um, considering you can see down there that uh, they had to initiate CPR four times. This patient went into a PEA rhythm, um, but they were able to achieve ROSC every time. The authors, without knowing that this was a chloroquine uh, poisoning, did give two boluses of uh, uh, intralipid. You can see that they also treated the patient with potassium supplementation and sodium bicarbonate. And then a couple of hours into the resuscitation, uh, uh, found that the patient uh, was poisoned by chloroquine and initiated high dose diazepam therapy as well. And this patient actually did uh, supposedly made a full recovery and was extubated seven days later. I've also come across some case reports of patients being uh, uh, placed on ECMO in the setting of uh, kind of refractory shock in uh, chloroquine uh, toxicity. Um, but again, you know, both ILE and ECMO would kind of be case report uh, um, evidence for this. And then one last thing to mention and keep in mind uh, is the pediatric considerations. This is a 2005 review that looked at chloroquine in children under six. Um, and you can see just quickly scanning the outcome column uh, almost universally is not a good outcome. And the cases that I've highlighted in red here are older children, most of them three years old, um, that had ingested only one or two tablets of chloroquine. This first case is a three-year-old who ingested one tablet of chloroquine and within an hour um, basically had a cardiac arrest and was uh, pronounced dead. Uh, similarly here, a three-year-old with just uh, one and a half or two pills of chloroquine uh, was dead two and a half hours into uh, their ingestion. Um, so it's not just kind of small neonates or small infants. Uh, you know, one pill can certainly kill a, a three-year-old child. Uh, so on that note, um, I think we'll give the leader of the free world uh, kind of one last uh, uh, one last word. And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. And you'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. 
When? Right start. now, yeah. yeah when a couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. Because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. And if it's not good, I'll tell you right, I'm not going to get hurt by it. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. Frontline workers take it. A lot of doctors take it. Excuse me. A lot of doctors. Anyway, it goes on like that for like five minutes. Um, these are the take home points uh, I'd like to kind of highlight uh, for the end of the, uh, the rounds. Bleach ingestion is a unique caustic ingestion in that accidental ingestion is often fairly benign. Patients can be discharged after a period of observation as uh, so long as they remain asymptomatic. Um, but with bleach ingestion and certainly any other caustic ingestion um, in household cleaner ingestion, symptomatic patients or high risk patients uh, need to be admitted for monitoring and endoscopy usually within 24 hours. Uh, chlorine gas is one of many pulmonary irritants that uh, can be made by mixing household cleaners and the mainstay of treatment is supportive care with uh, oxygen bronchodilators, uh, some steroids and uh, positive pressure ventilation if needed. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, both uh, highly toxic in the overdose setting, um, can rapidly cause uh, death. Early intubation um, with epinephrine as the vasopressor of choice uh, and the use of high dose diazepam. Um, are the mainstays of treatment, and then things like replacement of potassium um, and uh, uh, sodium bicarb. Things like intralipid or ECMO can kind of be part of the proverbial kitchen sink uh, method in patients that are uh, refractory to all of these. Um, and finally, good to keep in mind that one to two pills of chloroquine uh, can be lethal to uh, pediatric, uh, so important to keep in mind when, when dealing with pediatric ingestion. Um, there's a list of my references, and I'm certainly happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, I'm happy to uh, wrap it up there. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I know it's gonna be a long day of lots of Zoom meetings, uh, but yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brendan, that was a great talk. Yeah, thanks, Brendan, great talk, well done. Thanks guys.